So before many applications are being containerized and being hosted in Kubernetes, one of the tasks that many organizations are facing is the need to modernize those applications to make them more cloud native and more prepared for technologies like containerization and orchestration. And one of the tools that operates in this space as in, and is currently is a CNCF sandbox project is called Conveyor. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today in this episode and how it can help with exactly this task of modernizing applications. So my name is Kristina Devochko. I'm Michael Levan. And in today's episode, we have with us Savita, who is contributing a lot to the Conveyor project. So hello, Savita. Thank you for finding the time to join us. Hello. Hi. Thank you for having me on the show. It's my pleasure. A little bit intro about me. I am a software engineer at Red Hat, and I have been contributing to open source for the past five years. I started with Kubernetes. I used to be a platform engineer. And then oh. I always wanted to work at uh, Red Hat. It was a dream because of the pro open source and everything. And finally, I got a chance to work on the current team. The current project that I'm working on is called Conveyor, which is a CNCF sandbox project that helps with Kubernetes adoption. So I've just moved from being an end user, someone who was creating platforms for end users to deploy their application to the other side of the spectrum where I'm like helping people to embrace Kubernetes and run their workloads on Kubernetes. And I also care about the environment and I love whales. There was this keynote at one of the cube cons by Holly uh, Cummins. I think I'm pronouncing her last name correct. If I'm not, I'm really sorry. So she was talking about the data center, the energy that comes out of it in the ocean and how it is affecting the marine life and everything. And I started digging more, and I think it was like a couple of years ago, the keynote was given and it was virtual, I think, during the pandemic. So I started learning a little bit more and what you can do around home. And then um, I stumbled across the CNCF initiative. So I've been CNCF initiative for environmental sustainability. So I've been dabbling there a little bit, learning. I'm hoping to spend more time and start contributing a little bit more there. Yeah, Ooh. and th and their logo is whale, so which is really yeah. really cute. And the last time at KubeCon, I couldn't get a sticker, so I'm hoping that next time, <laughs> whenever I'm there, you know, like I've already reserved uh, stickers saying that please say one for me. <laughs> yeah, normally stickers is not an issue at uh, conferences like KubeCon and Cloud Native Con, but you never know. That probably depends on which kind of sticker you're out for. <laughs> exactly. Like sometimes you just you know that they are. I hunt for stickers. I totally get what you're saying. Sometimes they are all just gone, just like that. <laughs> Unless it's like GitHub who are bringing stickers. They weigh the stickers, I think. I saw in a tweet or something that uh, they bring stickers based on the number of kilograms or <laughs> pounds based on wherever you are. I'm like, yeah. You've been doing quite uh, a lot as part in the open source and in the CNCF. That's very cool. And uh, to be honest, regarding Conveyor, like me, I haven't heard or been involved. Like I've heard about Conveyor project, but I haven't been, haven't had any use cases or like a a, um, a reason to to test it out yet. That's why mm -hmm. I will be like putting on my, uh, I don't know much about Conveyor, so I'll be asking stupid questions hat uh, today. But maybe Michael, have you heard or used Conveyor uh, before? No, actually, I have not. It looks pretty interesting, though, from what I've gathered from my beginner level experience here. It's an operator designed for OpenShift, right? Or does it work even outside of OpenShift? So it's mainly <clears throat> targeting <throat> Kubernetes and it supports other platforms to the CNCF sandbox version. It's the upstream and that's a conveyor and that is uh, predominantly targeting Kubernetes adoption but it can support other platforms like OpenShift, AKS, EKS, any other flavors of Kubernetes uh, platforms that you want to adopt. There is a downstream product um, that actually directly supports OpenShift. That's called MTA. But I think for this conversation, 
for about conveyor, it is like mainly Kubernetes adoption first. Hmm. So if it's an operator running in Kubernetes, aren't we kind of beyond the adoption phase? So I'm wondering, like, in what way does it help with Kubernetes adoption if it's an operator running in Kubernetes? So that's my first stupid question coming out. <laughs> I'm, I'm giggling because you just you stole my question. That was exactly oh, what I was going to ask. <laughs> So think of conveyor as you are driving a car and you have this lane assist system and it is there to help you reach your destination safely and it is going to guide you. So conveyor, conveyor operator deploys the web app conveyor in simple layman terms and it contains the portfolio of applications. So it's just like a tool that you can have have it running any cluster, any Kubernetes or any OpenShift cluster. and in that tool, you're going to import all the legacy applications that you want to modernize. So those legacy mm -hmm. applications necessarily, they don't have to be on Kubernetes. They can be like on a VM or they can be in however way that they are like outdated. They can be containerized, but they are outdated like running Java 11. But right now it's going to be end of life and everyone wants to, again, use the latest version of Java. And many actually this comes into uh, play for larger organizations where they have been um, running the applications for really, really long time, but the applications would have been written five, six, year, seven years ago, and it's working. So no one wants to do anything to it. I think of and in environments where there are like strict regulations, think of banking or think of like retail where they have heavy security and compliance and they have picked a language, for example, Java, and they have written their applications in Java and that's been running for ages. Like ages, I just say like six, seven years old. And right now, every organization has seen the movement towards cloud. They are heavily invested on cloud and everyone's adopting the CNCF ecosystem, starting with Kubernetes and then using every other project in the ecosystem to add observability, monitoring, security and whatnot. So the entire ecosystem. Um, they are heavily invested there, and they also have applications running uh, somewhere else, but not on the cloud in the way that they want, because they are either monoliths or they are very old and they are not suited for cloud. So that's where Conveyor mm -hmm. comes in a picture. What it is going to do is it's going to analyze the applications and it is going to provide insights into the application saying like, for example, I want to move this Java 11 application into containerized it, and then I want to upgrade the Java 11 to Java 17. So in the tool, there are targets. So you can pick these two targets like containerization and Java 17. So what it will do is it will analyze the application and it will provide insights saying, okay, these are the 10 issues that you have to absolutely, like you have to mandatorily address in order to move to cloud. If you don't address this, you cannot deploy your application. That would be like sometimes file IO, the old legacy applications tend to use a lot of NFS or like file system. And that might not work well with the Kubernetes and the cloud. So it will find such issues and tell like, oh, this line number of this file has a reference to a file location. Take a look at it and like see if you want to update. So it's not going to automatically refactor the code, but it is going to provide all the insights. And these applications can be grouped together to create migration waves. That is very helpful for larger organizations because they'll have hundreds of applications so they can target, okay, this two weeks, in this two weeks, I'm going to do the first five applications. See, think Conveyor as a tool that is enabling the modernization journey for all the larger organizations. I might have taken a little detour, but does that answer that it's an operator which is deployed in Kubernetes and how it is enabling the adoption? Yeah, makes yeah. sense. So it's essentially, just to make sure that I'm on the same page, it helps you with the migration process for legacy-based apps. But in terms of overall adoption, like let's say we're talking about raw Kubernetes adoption, like there's no Kubernetes in your environment. 
um, the engineers would still be responsible for getting their cluster up and running with, you know, whatever they're going to use, whether it's Terraform or whatever. Um, they're going to get that up and running. They're going to get the best practices up and running, et cetera, from a security perspective, from an overall best practice perspective. Once those clusters or one cluster is running in their environment and it's good to go, then they can begin to use Conveyor for the overall migration process. That is true. You exactly got it. So it assumes that you already have cluster and the infrastructure in place, and it is going to just modernize the applications. It's not modernizing the infrastructure. It is mainly targeted towards the application. Um, the goal is to provide application modernization through uh, refactor and uh, replatforming. It's not going to do any of the other. So um, there is this Amazon AWS documentation, which describes the modernization process, and it has six R's. Like it's reuse, rehost, replatform, refactor, and I forgot the other two. I cannot recall. <laughs> but Conveyor just focuses mainly on the two. One is replatforming, another one is uh, refactoring. And the thing that it is help the larger organizations also have time crunch, right? So they don't want to invest on totally uh, green fielding an application. So they just want to take and make minimal changes and make sure that it runs in the cloud to get them going and iteratively keep working on the application. So in that space, Conveyor is really helpful. So it can help with lifting and shifting and then lifting and shifting to Kubernetes with minimal changes for an application. So it can just pinpoint, these are the basic changes that you need to do so that your application can run on Kubernetes. By no means, I would say that is like the best practice for the application, but it at least gets the organizations to get the ball rolling and get their applications on Kubernetes, and then they can incrementally start working on how to improve that application. They can even think about microservices and things like that. Yeah, so things like, uh, for example, analyzing the application to suggest like reducing the coupling or uh, trying to like remove or make the application more... Uh, with components that are more independent of each other, things like that, that go more into the architectural side of the application that would probably be outside of scope for such a tool, right? Yeah, so it's in the future roadmap that we'd also want to support monolith to microservices. Uh, so just like how you can split things out. I think when it starts out, it would be like more like a guidance and then like it will evolve based on the user inputs and whatnot. There is only so much that you can build as a tool, but at the end of the day, sometimes things will depend on the human um, aspect of it. And also the person who is working on the application for that company knows better what, what's needed in their domain. So I think it will start out as a guidance and then it will evolve, but I haven't talked to anyone in the team about it. I'm just saying that like, okay, <laughs> I know it's in the roadmap that it's going to be supported um, in the future, but I have no idea like how they would go about it yet but uh, there have been like some ask um, would you support microservices like monoliths to microservices so that's something that would be worth investing and thinking about and there are a lot of questions about ai too so that's another thing like uh, we are trying to figure out if we could do automated uh, refactoring of the code like suggest folks, this is the replacement of this particular snippet. And the person who is migrating can choose if they want to accept it or deny it. Like ultimate power lies in the user who is using the tool. So it's not going to automatically change every single piece of code and deploy it. A conveyor is not going to do that. Um, but it will make the journey really, really simple and easy for people. And it is easier for people with even less domain knowledge so that they don't have to learn everything Java that to, in order to migrate and modernize. Just wanted to ask a scenario here. I don't know, I don't know if this is accurate or not, but I'm, I'm just curious here. So let's say, for example, I have a VM, right? And I'm mm -hmm. running a Python-based application. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm running on whatever version of Python and I have, you know, several libraries and several packages and stuff 
that the application needs to run, right? So, and it's just running as a standard Python app, not containerized, just on a Linux box. Mm -hmm. Will Conveyor like kind of scan that virtual machine to see how to turn that application into a container? Um, I ask from like, the, I'm trying to figure out the migration process, like what that migration process would look like, or does it already have to be a container? So Conveyor will scan the source code. So you can provide the Git repository. So it's going to scan the Git repository and then take all the, for example, it's going to probably start looking into all the um, requirements, uh, the dependencies and the requirements.txt and whatnot. So it'll go from there. Um, so initially, um, it used to use this um, plugin called Windup, which is a migration modernization tool for Java. But recently, like the last year, we just released our ODA 3.0 that uses multi-language analyzer. So the concept is it's built on top of LSP. LSP was developed at Microsoft uh, for VS Code. So any language that has a language server protocol and a language server can be easily integrated. So that is the concept that has been taken. And a conveyor supports any language that has a language server. Even now, if it doesn't say list out things like, uh, so we are working on .NET and we are working on uh, Python, I think, with the support of some community people. So for example, in the future, someone says like, hey, I want to modernize Node applications. All that it's needed is that Node already has a language server. Um, so Node projects can be integrated. And um, the way that it works is that it analyzes applications through a set of rules. So as long as the author rules and put it in the system, it will just analyze all the applications. So that is like, uh, for us, the contribution to rules uh, so that, that can, the rules can be taken or the experiences can be taken and used for analysis, that is the core. That is where we also need help. So we are always seeking out for migration stories. One person or one team cannot be expert in all languages. Uh, maybe there are people who exist like that. So I don't want to speak for everyone. I'm sorry. I'm just going to say speak for myself. I don't think I can. I personally cannot be like knowing everything in the world. So that's where the community aspect also comes together where people can come and share their stories. And um, the architecture of Conveyor currently lets you expand to any language that has a language server. Even like if COBOL as a language server, that can also be integrated. So if I COBOL as a language server, I have no idea. But if it has, then it can be integrated with Conveyor and then it can assist with the migration path. I think a few organizations would have appreciated that. I'm constantly reading about some of the banks uh, having these old servers somewhere in the basement where the crucial banking applications are running on COBOL and they're looking for COBOL developers. Maybe that's uh, that's something for Conveyor then. Just a brief pause to ask, did you know Packet Pushers has a job board? Whether you're looking to find or fill your next great IT infrastructure role, the Packet Pushers job board is the place to go. It's easy to post, easy to browse, and easy to apply. So whether you've got IT talent or you're looking for IT talent, visit jobs.packetpushers.net and get to work. That's jobs.packetpushers.net. And they make a lot of money too. You need a COBOL developer to come in. They're probably making like $300 an hour. So yeah, it's pretty crazy. I know a couple of people that have been like developers for years, obviously, and they're not doing it full-time anymore, but every once in a while they'll get a call and they're like, all right, 300 bucks an hour. <laughs> so yeah, I'm sure the banks really want to move away from that as much as fast as possible. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that would be cool. Like that would be a cool part-time job, you know, like, yeah. I mean, I just want to take a break. Am I the quickest $300 per hour that I'm going to make by using my, like, sitting comfortably in my place, in my pajamas, and I <laughs> just covered. Not a bad amount of work for a couple thousand bucks per day, that's for sure. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, but I mean, in general, it's like in my head, it's quite a complex use case to build a tool for so that it actually is able to provide some meaningful recommendations, right? Because one thing is providing like very generic recommendations that you can basically go to the cloud provider and read about or like the very common knowledge about the 
things like container images being lightweight uh, is most preferred or, you know, looking into ways to create a more lightweight application, you know, that kind of doesn't help very much like because you mm -hmm, already mm -hmm. know that that's the thing but like where can you start are there small steps concrete small steps that you can start doing before you take this whole gigantic application and for instance and start fully re-architecting it because it's a tough task to start with but you need to start somewhere and kind of finding that way to provide meaningful recommendations meaningful concrete steps you can take in my head, I feel like it can be a bit tough because there are so many different applications in so many programming languages, like you say. So, like, where do you take this inspiration from, you can say? Where do you get those recommendations out? Like, uh, do you have some insights on that? All these insights, to my knowledge, comes from people who have already experienced migrating. For example, there are solution engineers or there are migration engineers who would be helping the companies or the organization assist move from this platform A to platform B. So they have this wealth of knowledge and they have already done the work. So some of the knowledge comes from interacting with people who are actually in the field helping the migration, okay? Tell me what are all the things that you actually uh, had to deal with and um, what are all the things that can be automated? What is the common technology? So targeting, those things are really a good uh, place to start with because otherwise, like you said, it's like an ocean and it's really hard to know where to start, what mm -hmm. to do. So these kind of insights actually provide the need in the market at least, mm -hmm. okay, right now the trend is to move from this technology A to technology B. And I assisted in this movement of like 10 applications. And here are the 10 things that I actually found. So coding them into rules, um, would act, it's actually like beneficial because the other person who is in the same situation doesn't have to go through the 10 steps again. The conveyor can analyze and provide that information. Hey, these are the... 10 things that you would have to uh, take care of before you migrate, like before you deploy your application to Kubernetes. That is also another place where we struggle right now because we need experiences. So we need outreach, we need awareness. Not so many people get what Conveyor does and not so many people understand the, when I say like adoption of Kubernetes or OpenShift, because many engineers that I interact during KubeCon Whoever is in the project pavilion, if they come and they start interacting, a lot of them are new grads. They have never seen some application that run for like five years, 10 years. They only know like the newer programming context. They know only like all the fancy Go, Rust, Python, whatnot. And there are like people who think it's an infrastructure tool because you are in the landscape. And either it's a security or infrastructure, that's that's what they assume naturally. That is one area that we'll have to like create. I have tried um, explaining to the best of my knowledge and people are like, oh, wow, so my company is moving. So we could actually use this tool. So um, that, that's how like we get to learn some of the use cases. The crowd in the KubeCon that actually understands and uh, relates to Conveyor is a bunch of uh, consultants who are platform engineers or like sysadmins who are supporting their organization go through the migration journey. So they really understand, oh, okay, so I can deploy this tool and then I can just give it to the team, DevOps team or like migration team who is responsible and they would be able to find the things that's needed to needed in that particular app so that that can be addressed, issues that can be addressed and it can be migrated. And there is the gap. The, the gap exists because there is a lot of knowledge out there and we cannot personally, like I wouldn't be able to know everything, every single use case, unless mm -hmm. and un until someone talks to me about it, there is no way. Similarly, like, so that's why we lean on people who are doing the migration work. We lean on experiences. We talk to, um, whenever I'm at KubeCon, I'm like asking 
um, folks who are stopping by the kiosk, like, hey, um, your company has gone through this journey. Like, tell me your experience because I want to learn from your experience so that we can make this tool better for someone else who can come along, right? So for me, the community aspect of it is also like sharing the knowledge and uh, growing as a community together. I don't see it as a race. I just see it as like, we are all in this together to grow together. It's not a race. That's how I see it. It I, sounds I'm, like I'm, you're very engaged about the project. I am very passionate about the community as well, the aspect of it. So I also lead the conveyor community. So I'm always in the lookout for how to make it a very welcoming and safe environment for people to uh, come in and start contributing or even use the project. I got the inspiration by participating in the Kubernetes project for a really long time. It's a very inclusive environment. So I took some of the uh, inspiration and my learnings from there and I put it in the conveyor community. So I'm really passionate about that. That's why I, I digressed into the community. Somehow my brain's wired weird. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that's obviously the biggest part, right? Because the the tech, the creation of a project and a product overall, you know, that that's something that's almost obvious in a sense. But the thing that is really important is the people aspect, uh, the community aspect, you know, because to your point, everybody's kind of working on it together. Everybody needs to uh, feel that what they're working on actually makes sense and that they're providing value for everybody. That's arguably how humans thrive overall, right? Ensuring that we're providing value and doing something of importance. So absolutely agree with you there. One last question on my end. Uh, I just want to make sure right now it's just for Java-based applications, right? Or is it for others? Right now, out of the box, yes, it just supports Java right now. But we are also working on uh, providing .NET. That is in the works. And uh, there are community contributions for Python. That is in the works. So probably in a few months, um, we will also have that in, um, integrated. There are like ways to support it right now. Like I said, any language that has language server can be integrated. Um, but we are working on those, adding those two um, languages to the platform. Um, right out of the box, it supports um, Java. And I also think it supports Go, if I'm not wrong, but I need to go back and check on that. Hmm. Yeah. Is it written in Go, the project itself? Or? Yes, it's written in Go. That is also another thing, right? So when you're in the CNCF landscape and you're looking for contributors, Go is another common language where everyone collaborates a lot. Yeah. I mean, there are other languages too. Like I personally like Python because I used to be a platform engineer. Like I was very close to developing all the things in Python back then. So I am biased towards that, but I really um, enjoy programming in Go as well. And the new thing that I see is Rust. And whenever we have some POC, we keep thinking like, oh, we should try out Rust. But the <laughs> slope to learn and get something running really quick is like the curve is too big. Someday, someday it will all be like, you know. <laughs> yeah, oh, I totally get that. <laughs> Very much necessary. Yeah, I would say probably the biggest ones right now, right? In our space, Go, Python, Rust, kind of. I know there's a lot of adoption going on around it. I feel like it's still like up and coming, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, compared to the other languages, at least compared to the other languages. Awesome. So before we start wrapping up here for the day, Christina, did you have any final thoughts? Maybe a final question to round this up with, uh, Savita. So like you mentioned regarding the most valuable additions you can add to the tool come from real life experiences, real project experiences from the companies. And I totally agree with you because Documentation is one thing, but those folks coming from the field who have faced these challenges firsthand can really provide valuable input to make tools like Conveyor even better. Mm -hmm. So for our listeners who may be those front runners and would like to share their input and the struggles they have faced in this migration and modernization processes, what is the easiest way for them to share this information with you as an input to future development of Conveyor? 
There are many ways. And thank you. Thank you for helping create more awareness and also engagement of the project. I appreciate it. So there are many ways. We have a Slack channel conveyor in the Kubernetes Slack workspace. And I can share it with the team, Christina and Michael, and yeah. they'd be able to share it. And there are mailing lists. That is another way that uh, folks can reach out to us. And or just open an issue in the GitHub project. And that is also another way we are always looking at the issues. We will be triaging the issues. So those three are the easiest ways to reach mm -hmm. out. And those also help with the public learning. So if someone comments and the other person can say, hey, I also have faced this. So like you chime in and it's learning and growing in public. So those three channels definitely support that. Other than that, we do have a user group called Migration Experience. Right now, we are not running any meetings for it. We want to make it more active. Um, so if anyone wants to contribute or volunteer, that is also another user group that is just focused on learning about the migration experiences and how can we bring it back into the tool and uh, make the tool more better. That would help others who want to go through their own modernization journey. Makes sense. Cool. Awesome. Well, Savita, now I would like to ask if there's anything else that you would like to plug. Uh, I know we talked about the project a ton, where people can find it, et cetera. But is there uh, maybe like, do you have a blog or like any other thing that you would like to plug for the episode? We have the conveyor website as blog that people can take a look at it and learn more about it. There is another major initiative that is coming up is that we are um, looking for contributors who would like to contribute to documentation. We have a working group that is kicking off next week on Wednesday. I think I can share the meeting and the time later. So if you just want to get started and you want to improve the documentation, use the project, improve the documentation, that is also another place where we could use contributors in addition to your experience. And any contribution is a contribution. So I just say people that don't think like you are going to comment, even a comment is useful. I just want right. to let people know that, yeah. It doesn't have to be code contributions all the time. Very cool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining today. Really appreciate it. This was super helpful. Thank you to everybody that's listening.